Welcome, everyone. Uh, and first, thanks for the DEF CON sponsors to get us here. Um, today, I'm with, here with my colleague, Alessandro. Uh, we are part of Red Hat's site reliability engineering team working on managed services with a twist, uh, which we come to later. Uh, and our talk is about how we manage to gain some of our, or retain some of our sanity in what we do. <laughs> and show what we've built over the last past few months. So, Alessandro, please. Me? Okay. Hi, everyone. So, my name is Alessandro. I'm a senior SRE at Red Hat, and let's start. And let's start with uh, our uh, talk with an example application that will help us through the whole talk. Um, we have the three standard layers like UI, API, and DB. Um, again, here we have some an example of the resources we may deploy on a Kubernetes cluster, but this is just an example. There should be more. So let's focus on the three uh, green one. So two deployments for UI and API and one for DDB it will be helpful later. And let's assume you already have this beautiful application running on your Kubernetes cluster and everything work, works fine, life is good. But then at some point, the dev team wants to deploy an update for your application, right? So you as an SRE, you don't have already big uh, processes in place. So you're just started and you get from the dev team, you get a good old folder with some YAML files containing the deployment and the stateful set for the database. You look at it, it's all fine. So you accept the challenge and you deploy it. So what do you do? You use your uh, beloved kubectl command, and you apply the whole folder. And after a few seconds, everything seems fine. So you're like very happy about how cool Kubernetes is and such what a beautiful tool you're using. Uh, but then you're a smart guy, so you go and check, did this actually work? Um, so what do you do? You go and check uh, the deployment and the stateful set using your beloved kubectl, and you see that everything is running fine, right? So now you're super happy and you go grab your coffee. But then a few moments later, when you go back to your uh, laptop, um, you look at your Slack icon and well, it looks like this. And you go and check one of the chats and you have your annoying dev that tells you, hey man, the new UI is down. So what, what have you done? And then panic starts and you go and look and what the hell, I mean, the pods for the UI are all crash looping. What's going on? So panic, panic keeps going, but then you have a moment of sanity and you remind yourself that you can undo what you just did, right? So you regain your calm and you just undo, uh, you just basically roll back the deployment for the UI and you think that everything, everything is okay, but then after a few seconds, then you're panic again because it's still crash looping. So what the hell is going on? Um, and you write to the same dev in the Slack chat and the dev tells you, well, the old UI don't work with the new API because we make some breaking changes there. So you're still panicking, but you think I can think about doing it again. So roll back also the API deployment, hoping that the database had no changes, right? You try to do that uh, with the same command before and it rolls back, actually rolls back, but uh, at this point, you gain, re regain your calmness because you see that everything is running fine. So luckily, the database had no changes. So rolling back everything solved the problem temporarily. This is a typical day in the life of an SRE. So uh, things keep breaking randomly, and you don't know why. But let's try to see what happened, uh, the events that brought us here. So we received some YAML file from our dev team. We trusted them. And then we used like our kubectl tool, but in the end, we could have also used um, customize or Helm to do the same thing. And those tools, what they did, they just like pushed resources to Kubernetes and let Kubernetes uh, do the reconciliation. I mean, I said just because that's what they are designed for, so they worked as expected. And now I have a question for you, which is which step is to blame for the failed update? The developer. Yeah. yeah. The, the YAML, you exactly. Uh, well, no, the YAML were fine, but things keep breaking for some reason, so we don't know why. The content of the container may have been broken, but 
the reality is that in this picture, none of these steps uh, are to blame for the failed update. So we actually have a problem from an SRE point of view because our tools are like, well, I mean, we did our job, so don't, don't look at us for the failed update, okay? It's not our fault. But in the end, as SRE again, the update failed, right? And the update could have caused our SLOs to fail as well. And the problem is that the SLOs are the actually, actual thing that matters in the end for an SRE, right? Uh, so we have a problem, but we, as an SRE, our mindset is to analyze the problems that we face and try to turn them into ideas to improve our workflow, our tooling, blah, blah, blah. So let's try to analyze the problem we just had. Um, first of all, we have loosely coupled objects. Uh, every, every object that we push to the Kubernetes container is loosely coupled. So what if instead we have something that allows us to bundle those resources together in one package? Spoiler. Um, second uh, point is uh, the status of all these coupled objects are, is distributed and heterogeneous. So it's hard to understand. It's hard. It takes time to see if the deployment succeed, succeeded and all the other resources. So what if instead we had an aggregated status for this bundle of objects that tells me if the update actually worked, right? The third one is all at once rollouts. So you push all the resources together at the same time and then you let Kubernetes do the reconciliation. But sometimes this is not enough. So what if instead we can have, we could have an incremental control rollouts of those resources, right? Uh, so for example, we try to deploy the DB. If it works, then we deploy the API. And if it works, we deploy the UI, right? And the fourth and last point for this slide is complex rollbacks because we saw that the deployments have um, an easy mechanism for rollbacks, right? But what if we could have the same concept for any type of resources that we deploy to the Kubernetes cluster? It would be very nice, right? And now I'll hand over to Nico for the second part. Yeah, so um, I'm not here to tell you why we can't have nice things in what we do because of scale and compliance, right? Scale, yeah, everyone wants scale and compliance, boo, right? <laughs> um, and if we take the ideas that Alessandro already introduced and try to turn them into solutions, we had some excellent talks during the last days talking about things like, hey, we need to bundle our resources together, right? So we want something like GitOps, right? You put all your stuff into a repository and if you need to roll something back, you change something in the repository and magic happens and it appears in production. If you have a problem with status, right? You don't know what's going on. You have monitoring. I, at least I hope you have monitoring, <laughs> right? Um, but there are solutions for this, right? And even with for more complex processes like incremental rollouts, you can rely on Argo CD, or essentially pick your poison, right? There are plenty of CI, CD tools out there who have um, plenty uh, instructions on how to set up sensible rollout strategies. And in the end, for rollbacks, right, you can make backups. Valero is a nice tool for Kubernetes backups. Um, or there was a nice talk here a few days ago about Argo rollouts, which um, also includes automatic rollbacks. Super nice. So can we have nice things? Well, yes, but actually no. Uh, so all of these projects are super nice. I highly recommend them, but I can't use them. And well, first, because of the scale that we're operating at. Um, my team, we are not operating with like tens of clusters or a few hundred clusters. We are tasked with operating across thousands of clusters and closing in like 10,000 of clusters. Admittedly, not all of them have managed services deployed that we take care of, but still all of these clusters need to have the ability to install managed services at any given point in time, right? Because in the end, our customers, they don't care how we make the ma magic happen in the end. They just want their push button deployments, right? They swipe their credit card, get their, um, their quota, and then they start installing stuff. Um, and they don't care that our backend infrastructure has a hard time coping with like thousands of clusters. But this is where stuff becomes tricky because all of the tools that are commonly available, they don't quite work at this scale. And then there's an even bigger problem. Those are not our clusters. 
those clusters belong to our customers. It, they run in their AWS, their cloud accounts, right? So just music stops. Because this is a big one. This means, well, one does not simply send data out of the cluster, right? We can't just take whatever data we want and ship it outside of the cluster because even such simple things as the name of namespaces in the Kubernetes cluster, right? It's just like a folder name in Kube. They might uh, contain sensible information about a customer's next big project, right? You, you can't just take that and, and put it into our management systems. Um, we also don't want to install random open source projects there. Like, I mean, Argo CD is not random, but we can't install it on the customer cluster because the, the customer might use Argo already. We also have a problem because we can't grant ourselves arbitrary permissions because some of our customers get really upset if you hand over the keys to the kin kingdom, if you will, and give everyone permissions. And we can't go around proxies either, right? So we have um, a few ways to communicate with those clusters. Um, and otherwise, they might be really isolated. So in the end, one does not simply walk into Mordor if you don't own the place, right? But we, that's essentially why we couldn't use available open source tooling and instead set off of the venture of, well, building our own thing, right? And Alessandro will now show how we destructured the problem into smaller chunks. Okay, and thank you. Work. Thank you, Nico, again. Um, so if you carefully read the title of this talk, um, we spoiled the name of the thing we built for this, and it's called Package Operator. So now let's try and see what's like a very high level overview of what's inside package operator and how it could try to help us solving the problems that we highlighted before. So as I said back uh, before, like deployments are nice because they have some characteristics that help us dealing with pods in this case. Uh, but what if, we, what if we could have deployments for whatever we want to get to the, to the cluster, right? Um, so I think I don't have focus on the oh, window sorry. anymore, sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm you so stole sorry. my focus. Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> so what we came up with in package operator um, is a concept similar uh, um, to replica sets. So replica sets handles pods, right? What we would like to have is a replica set for whatever. And we came up with this object set uh, resource that is part of package operator again and which is able to reconcile a bunch of arbitrary objects and aggregate the status via probes. So every object set, you can watch the status and see if those objects are working as expected or not. It's very important that it's immutable and can be scaled to zero to archive for rollback. So this solves already some of the problems, tries to solve some of the problems that we saw before. And one of the important thing I want to point out is this phase reconciliation thing. Um, because let's, let's see it in detail, right? So in every object set, we can define different phases and assign the resources belonging to the bundle to uh, one, of a, one of these phases in a way that um, each phase starts only if the previous ones has successfully completed. How do we know if they are successfully completed? We define probes for each phase that uh, checks if the phase is actually completed, right? In this case, we have two CRDs that need to be deployed. If uh, some of you is not familiar with Kubernetes CRDs, they are basically a way to um, expand the Kubernetes APIs, defining uh, extra entities that allows you to do whatever you want in a way like very simple parallel uh, parallelism um, as you create new entities on a database, right? So you can define your own object to work with um, and extend the Kubernetes APIs, right? So here we have two CRDs. We have a probe that checks the, that they are established. So those gets deployed. And if the probe succeeds for both of them, then the phase is considered to be completed. And only at that point, we go to the next phase that contains a deployment <coughs> that relies on those CRDs, right? Because if we put together in the cluster at the same time, the deployment may try to become available before the CRDs are established and something may fail in there because the new entities are not yet established in the Kubernetes cluster. 
So after the first phase is done, then the second one, the deployment gets deployed, the probes check if it worked, and then the second phase is marked as successful. So replica sets are cool as object set, uh, sorry, object sets are cool as replica sets are, but deployments are uh, more helpful for us because they manage some of the um, replica sets um, internals in an easy way. So we created the same concept for object set as well, and we called it object deployment. And the object deployment coordinates the transition between object sets and keeps the history so that you can roll back, uh, like limited history, but you can do rollbacks if it doesn't work, and creates a new object set when updated and keeps the old one alive until the new one is successfully executed using the probes that you defined. So this is what, it, what is actually helpful and solves most of the problem, problems we saw earlier, right? Then finally, we introduce another concept that I spoiled earlier called packages, so which helps people to create those object deployments. And packages are, as I wrote in the slide, like a single artifact that contains all the manifests, configuration, and metadata needed to run an application. And as like RPMs or dev packages, you have a build phase in which you basically take your uh, YAML definitions of your resources and put them in a folder with whatever structure you want and um, add a manifest that contains some metadata about the package itself. You can also optionally add a readme file and an icon, as you can see on top of the list. And uh, most importantly, also you, um, on top of like plain YAML file, you can also use uh, Go templating capabilities to create resource templates that can be templated. And then you build the package and everything get, gets packed into a non-runnable container image that you can store in whatever registry you want. And uh, when you want to deploy that package, uh, you create a, a custom resource that can be a, either a package or a cluster package, depending on the scope you want to give to those resources. You specify the image that you built before in the spec.image field, and then package operator will pick that up and create all the object deployments and stuff for you. So here, here is a brief description of the internals of package operator. And then back to Nico for demo time. Thank yeah, so you. All of this might be a little bit abstract. Um, but essentially, our goal here was that we take all the smarts that are that, that you find in uh, like Argo and other open source projects and ship them in one single operator into those uh, customer Kubernetes clusters that we manage. So we can then instruct the on-cluster component to do those smart things <laughs> on the cluster without requiring us to have outside systems exfiltrating data, or um, working at that scale, right? Because at this point, you can abstract a lot of stuff away and offload that to the cluster directly. So what, I hope this, yeah, this works. Um, what you're seeing here is I have a local kind of cluster. Is the font big enough? Okay, okay, font, font works. Nobody can read. Uh, kind is Kubernetes and Docker, so it's super nice to get a Kubernetes cluster up and running super quickly. Um, I have package operator running here, and now I'm deploying something. So this is the deployment API that Alessandro just talked about. And what you see in here is we have one, so this is the Nginx example deployment. We have one phase, the deploy phase, so we keep it super simple for the beginning. And in here we have two objects, a config map and a deployment, right, the normal Kubernetes deployment for the actual workload. And we define how package operator can make sense of those objects with a declarative probe. So here we say, okay, select everything that is a deployment and check is it available and is updated replicas equal, fields equal to status replicas, right? Which gives us not only the sign is the deployment uh, 
available, but also is it updated? And spoiler, there are a few versions here. I'm making it extra interesting. So check deployment created. So it's doing stuff. It's immediately available because somebody already preloaded all the images. So we see, okay, there is a deployment, there is config map and pods. Super nice. What sets this apart from a lot of other solutions is that when we uh, watch, because of those probes and everything being connected, if something crazy happens on that cluster, like somebody goes in and deletes all the pods, we see that status reflected in our generic application deployment. And for us as SREs, that's already huge, right? Because without looking at any monitoring system, without looking at specific application telemetry, we can already see, okay, something specific is wrong when we look at this deployment. Uh, it immediately, you know, Kubernetes is very well at self-healing itself, so this is going back to work right away. Um, but if you happen to stumble over this cluster because of, of an actual incident, having a single resource that tells you where stuff is wrong is already super useful. So let's now update stuff. That's where things get fun, right? So what I did just now is I'm doing multiple advanced co concepts at the same time. Because, um, okay, this is the same object deployment, I only just patched it with different data. Um, so we have uh, a new release, but we added a new strange uh, readiness condition. So here we see, okay, a new probe was added target config maps, and for some reason, whoever wrote this thought it's sensible to say, okay, for this to succeed, an annotation needs to be equal to a key in the, the config map. It's a very convenient way of essentially saying, okay, wait for somebody to do something. And if we look at what the deployment is telling us now, we see, okay, it's still available, that's nice. And we get back to that in a sec. And it's progressing, and something is stopping it from progressing to V2 at the moment. Because, hey, okay, the deployment phase failing at the moment because the config maps probe is failing, because, well, that annotation is not, uh, does not exist on that object. Right? And this could be any dependency be missing uh, from the, the deployment. So if we Something else that is funny here, um, I on purpose renamed the deployment to v2. So again, uh, making the jump to a previous talk here at the conference about uh, rollouts, progressive rollout. So this is a canary deployment strategy or an AB deployment. Right now we have two versions of this application running side by side until the new version passes all its rollout flags. Right? So they run side by side, super fine. Like no customer would see right now that V2 is blocked by something. And at the moment, somebody is setting this probe right. So the probe was saying this annotation needs to be equal to this data key. Safe. Bots terminating deployment. So only the v2 deployment remains and only the v2 config map is still here right because now the new revision passed all its probes and now the old one can go away right because the new stuff rolled out successfully you might say okay this, this um, is maybe a little bit too complicated when upgrading stuff but where this becomes super handy is spoiler if i'm updating it again and you know, mistakes happen. Mistakes happen all the time, and if mistakes happen across thousands of clusters, stuff gets expensive. 
So um, what happened here is, you know, a typo in the deployment pipeline somewhere and an image was referenced that doesn't actually exist. So Cube can't roll it out. That's where we see here an error, error image pull. Image pull back off, sorry. This will not never work, right? But you see the V2 deployment is still here and operational, right? And if we check uh, status information, We see, okay, the latest revision is unavailable because the deploy phase is failing because the deployment status condition is not available. This is super useful for us because imagine again you're an SRE, you are uh, being woken up in, at 3 a.m. in the morning because some cluster is failing. You can check this and you see immediately what's going on. And now if you, this is where the demo ends, Updated to update it again. And now we see, okay, V4 is running, V2 is gone, and V3, right? Because V3 never worked in the first place, so we can get rid of V2 was working until V4 took over, and now everything is fine again. And we wrote a small helper that can also give us like a, a rollout history on that cluster. So we see, okay, the first thing we deployed a few minutes ago worked. The second version worked, right? Eventually, after we patched it. The third one, well, oh no, did never work. So we mark it in our history as this was never successful. And the fourth one worked in the end. And this with just a single tool without needing to set up anything else, right? This is not connected to, to monitoring solutions. This is not needing data to get shipped off the cluster. Um, and this is what we are already using in production in some limited cases and want to build more tooling on. Yeah, so <laughs> that's what we did. Um, time for Q&A. Is it set required? Come again? The operator is already certified for Red Hat? It's not in the Red so, uh, the question was if the operator is certified by Red Hat, so it's not in Operator Hub or uh, officially supported by us, because that's something we're only using internally. We have to, the project is open source, and we're doing our best to keep open source stuff installable and nicely documented, so if you want to check it out, you can. And if there is enough uh, interest in it, I'm sure we will offer it in some capacity. With package operator, not run with new one. It's also uh, in the chat talk description. Okay, anything else? All right. Let's repeat, package-operator.run. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.